Sorry, Dell. <laughs> So what the uh, song predominantly is about is that this group is claiming they have a message and that this message is important and that this message is so important that they're going to declare it and they're going to declare it so strong that people are, might not like it. And therefore, in order for them to declare it right, they have to be tougher than leather. That's the name of the song, Tougher Than Leather. Now, what's sad about the song is that they never get beyond saying what the message is. They just say, we got a message, and we got to be tougher than leather to say it. We got a message, we got to be tougher than leather to say it. And I just want to go, well, what's your message? <laughs> they never say it. But nonetheless, this is what Stephen's going to be dealing with. We get to move to a different little tangent in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, what we've been dealing with is the beginning of the church and how the church got its start. And we have the apostles <laughs> And we, they're, they're becoming the first leaders, the first elder board, if you will, of the church. And they've been preaching a message. And they've been preaching it boldly. They've been receiving opposition. And they are going to have to continue preaching it boldly. Now comes the tangent. Because there was a time, as you might remember, where there were some Greek-speaking Jewish widows who were being neglected. And because these Greek-speaking Jewish widows were being neglected, then the leaders of the church, the apostles, got everyone together and said, we need, we need seven godly men, seven Greek-speaking men who are full of the Spirit and full of wisdom to be able to handle this matter. And the question is, once the seven people got selected, were they really godly men. Were they really full of wisdom? In other words, they're full of worldly understanding and, and competency. Were they really full of the spirit that the spirit empowered them? Did they have this reputation? Did they fit the bill? And we're going to find out what happens with the first of the seven men that were named Stephen. Before we kick into this, let's pray for our time together, and then we'll see what happens from this point forward. Heavenly Father, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to devote this time to studying your word. And Lord, as we do so this morning, uh, Lord, we had a time change. For some of us, that means we're rested. For some of us, that means that we are very much not rested. And so, Lord, I ask that you help us to be centered and focused this morning. Help us, Lord, to pay attention, to have our minds sharp and our hearts open that we will not daydream or be distracted, but instead allow ourselves to be convicted by the moving of your spirit, that we can honor you more today. This I pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. So, here we are, Stephen's leadership. Was Stephen really a leader to fit the bill? Did he achieve that status? Did he hit that bar? It says in chapter six of the book of Acts, verse eight, Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. So what does that seem to indicate to you? Did Stephen fit the bill? Yes, he most certainly did. In fact, Stephen is given the description equal to the apostles. The apostles were the ones that were always described as being full of power, doing signs and wonders. Paul later even says in, second, in, in Corinthians that uh, it, the signs of an apostle are the performing of signs and wonders. That's how you know who an apostle is versus the average Christian people in the church. And so we see now Stephen, it seems to be an exception, an odd exception, because he's not an apostle. He's not one of those of the core 12, and yet he is of the church, he's a, he's a godly man, and yet the Spirit chose to fill him in such a dynamic way that he too is able to perform signs and wonders, that he too is able to do things like the apostles, even more so than what any of the other Christians were able to do. Very unusual, very unusual. It's because that the Spirit is trying to show what delegation of leadership looks like and how you go about arranging that leadership, and how you begin deal, dealing with that. Here is Stephen, and he is the exact same almost as the apostles, but something's different. Something is oddly, uniquely different about Stephen, and we can start noticing what's different about him when we look at the opposition he deals with and what's happening during this opposition. 
So Stephen gets on the scene. He starts preaching. He starts working on getting the distribution of food, money, whatever's being dealt with to the Greek-speaking Jewish widows. So he's a guy with a ministry title that's very specific. It's not general, you know, ministry leader it's, or deacon. It's very specific. You're in charge of the Greek-speaking Jewish widows and handing, making sure they get the distribution of the needs that they have so that they can be, have all their needs met. And so Stephen's doing this, and he's preaching along the way, living his life like he should. Opposition comes along. You would expect this. The, the leaders are getting opposition. Why not the congregation? Right? That's what you would expect. At some point, if the congregation's following their leaders appropriately and are living the life that, that, of following Christ like they should be, you should expect to find opposition being not just upon the leadership. You should expect to find opposition at some point on some people within the congregation itself. That's what you would expect to find. And so we find in verse 9, Then some of what is called the Freedmen's Synagogue, composed of both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, came forward and disputed with Stephen. So it's interesting. There was more than one synagogue throughout the city of Jerusalem and throughout that area. It wasn't just the temple. The uh, temple, the, the Freedmen Synagogue, was one of the synagogues that was Greek-speaking. So Greek people sometimes would go there. There was like dozens of synagogues in the area. It wasn't just the temple. Okay, so that's something we kind of may not realize, but was definitely the case. But they were unable, these people, these, these uh, uh, members of this synagogue were unable to stand up against Stephen's wisdom. Okay, Stephen was a smart cracker. Okay, he was one smart cookie. He, he, was, he had a way of reasoning and arguing and a way of teaching and proclaiming that baffled the most educated Pharisee, Sadducee, whatever is in the area. It just baffled them. They couldn't deal with it. Any of the leaders that were there could not reason against Stephen. He was an arguer. We'll cover that in very great detail next week. Because next week we're going to look at his sermon, one of the longest, actually one of the longest sermons in the Bible and the longest in the book of Acts. It covers like 50 plus verses. We're going to spend a long time in that next week, so we're going to have a lot of fun. And we're going to look at his argumentative technique and what it was about and why he used it and how we can take advantage of it. <laughs> so it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you ever want to learn how to you know, argue with someone, come next week. We'll really harpen on those skills of yours because I know some of you may think you don't need it. <laughs> Just because you practice a lot doesn't mean you don't need help. <laughs> so we'll hit that next week. But they could not reason against him. So they were unable to stand up against his wisdom. And they could not stand up against the spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom he was speaking. Okay, so the Holy Spirit was also speaking through Stephen. So Stephen was, using, was speaking and the words were having an impact, an impact, an effect that was above and beyond what anybody else's speech could do. The Holy Spirit was involved here. So the people, by fighting Stephen, were fighting the Spirit. Okay, I don't know about you, but if you're trying to fight against the Holy Spirit, you're going to lose. It just doesn't seem like a good battle to get into. But nonetheless, that's what they were doing. Verse 11, then they persuaded some men to say, interesting, the men didn't really say this. They had to persuade them to say this. They had to convince them to lie. Just kind of tuck that away in the back of your mind. We'll want that later. They, so they convinced some men to lie, persuaded them to say, we heard him, Stephen, speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the general populace. They stirred up the elders and the scribes. So they came, dragged Stephen off. This is like a violent abduction. Okay, this is not just, hey, buddy, come here a second, we need to have a word with you. This is going up to him physically, hands-on, seizing him and pulling him, dragging him, and just dragging him on the ground. I picture it almost like if it were done today, they wrapped a rope around his ankles, tied it to the hitch of a 4x4, of a four four, and just kind of drove him off, and him dragging off in the dirt in the background. Okay, I imagine it hillbilly style. Okay, that's kind of what I, is, is that type of an attitude about this. Okay, so they grabbed him, dragged him off, and took him to the Sanhedrin. They also presented false witnesses who said, so again, we have more liars involved here, whether it's the uh, same people who were persuaded or additional people, we don't really know. It could go either way. Arguments both sides. Does it matter? You got false witnesses. That's the key part there. Okay, so they also presented false witnesses who said, this man does not stop speaking blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. 
For we heard him say that Jesus, this Nazarene, will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at him. This is the, if looks could kill, they would, and eventually they do. Okay, because Stephen's going to be the first recorded martyr in the book of Acts. Okay, so this is this, they're intently just staring at him. Okay, and we're going to see more of what's happening there in just a moment. But we just need to see that Stephen's opposition is different than the apostles' opposition. As you notice that. The apostles would preach, the leadership shows up, grabs the apostles, puts them in jail, tries to reason with them, can't, whips them, beats them, whatever, and sets them loose. Now the general populace is involved. Okay, there are people that aren't the leadership. Before, the general populace loved the apostles. They loved them. Peter would preach, and it would say that thousands were added to the number that day. Peter would preach and they'd get arrested and still thousands would be added to their number that day or people were added to their number daily. In other words, every time the apostles preached, people were getting saved, people were repenting, they were coming to Jesus, becoming their, entering into their citizenship, into the kingdom of God. This is what they were doing. Stephen preaches, no one gets saved. No one gets saved. It does not say anywhere that numbers were added during his time of speaking, only that he performed signs and wonders. Peter shows up and makes a, a lame man able to walk, heals people of their sicknesses, casts out demons, great things are happening, and people are getting saved, people are getting saved. Stephen shows up, helps people from walking, helps them get healed, drives out a demon, and does all these signs and wonders. No one getting saved. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Peter and the apostles are doing it, and the public is praising them. We love the apostles. We love the apostles. They're sitting there going, yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's what they're doing. And they're just going all Daniel Bryan on the apostles. But Stephen starts preaching, and everyone's going, boo, we don't like this guy. He's doing great signs and wonders. He's helping people. But we're going to believe a lie over the truth, over what we're seeing. We're going to believe these false testimonies. It's interesting that the leadership never got liars for the apostles, but they got liars for Stephen. It's interesting how the response against Stephen seems more urgent. Every time they're told, don't kill the apostles, don't kill the apostles, might get a riot on our hands, don't kill the apostles, if they're for God, you're going to be fighting against God, that's not a good position to be in, and they say, okay, we won't kill the apostles, but Stephen shows up, and now they're wanting to kill him, and they do. No warning about you might be fighting against God, no warning about the signs and wonders being from God, none of that. Instead, we get false testimonies, liars, uh, 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 the whole imperfections of the judicial system falls apart, it almost looks like Jesus' trial, where they had false people against Jesus, and they were rushing through things in an inappropriate way against Jesus, and that the testimonies against Jesus were inconsistent. The testimonies against Stephen are also inconsistent. In case you didn't notice, let me recap the testimonies against Stephen. There are three that were given, and they all differ, and they all raise in their extremities as far as how they're accusing Stephen. It starts off that these blaspheming Moses and God but then they change it later, and they end up saying that it was more serious than that. It was speaking against the temple and the law of Moses. And then they say again, we've heard him say about this Jesus, that this Jesus will destroy the temple and change Moses' law. And so they're, they're constantly adjusting their story, but there's one detail that is consistent sort of consistent, there's one common denominator amongst all three of their charges. Do you see what it is? Moses. The charge that is consistent is Moses. The other details are changing. You know, it's interesting that they say that he's speaking against the temple law of Moses. What about blaspheming God? That was one thing that was punishable by death under the Judaistic Old Testament law. Okay, but they got rid of that. That's not even on their final charge before the Sanhedrin. They never mentioned blaspheming God before the Sanhedrin at all. That's just what they used to get him arrested. Isn't that interesting that they changed it like that? And what they did keep the whole time was Moses. Here's why. The high priest was what type of a affiliation? Was he a Pharisee or a Sadducee? Do you remember? Sadducee, very good. Now, whoever holds the high priest position holds the power 
Okay, so the Sadducees hold the power. They're the ones that are in Rome's good graces. They're the ones that's working with the Roman government to keep the status quo, and they get the cutbacks and the, and the payoffs and blah, 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 and all the little perks. Okay, they get all that, so they want to keep it. The Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection because the Sadducees did not follow the entire Old Testament. The Sadducees believed in Moses only. They emphasized the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy. The Sadducees followed Moses. If Moses said it, that was all we need. Kind of like how some churches today are Paul only, and they just kind of discredit the rest of the Bible. And they go, Paul, Paul, Paul. If Paul said it, we follow it. If anybody else said it, who cares? Paul, Paul, Paul. I know people like that. I know, I know churches that are like that. It's Paul only. Sadducees were like that. Moses only. Okay, and so they were all about Moses. So therefore, if you're going to make a lie, tick off the Sadducees, tick off the scribes that come from the Sadducees, and tick off the high priest who is a Sadducee, the one detail you've got to make sure never to change is an accusation about going against... Moses, there it is, good job. So, you guys are ready to be a jury. Now, <laughs> so that is what's going on here. So that's what, they're, that's what they're doing. They're trying to get rid of Stephen. They want to get rid of him so bad they can taste it. That's interesting. It is just so interesting. It's, it's like they don't respect Stephen the same way that they respect the other leaders. It's like for some reason, since Stephen's not one of the big dogs, that he's more accessible for intimidation and execution and violation. It's almost like they say, you know, we don't feel like going after the people who have all the, all the uh, you know, PhDs and whatnot, but we'll go after these people who don't have that. We'll go after them. And if they tend to rise up to be as influential, if not even more so, but definitely equal to some of these big dogs, well, we can't have that because that means it's spreading. And while the people are all in favor of these big dogs because they're published and they, they follow them on Twitter and they're friends with them on Facebook and they, they, hang, they Google Plus hang out, chat with them, and on and on it goes, they don't do that with Stephen because he's a new kid on the block. So let's go ahead and ax him down right away. We see that even today in American society, the way people will go after a pastor whose his church explodes to be thousands and thousands of people, and once he starts getting a major voice, the media will attack him. Like, for example, Mark Driscoll was a guy who's recently gone under severe attack. Okay, granted, he didn't do everything right in his life. He's not a perfect man, like none of us are perfect people. And yet he was a godly man who spoke a godly message. And the people and the media and even his own church started attacking against him as he began growing up and up and up. Do they attack Chuck Swindoll? No. Do they attack Tony Evans? No. People, you don't get people on the news saying, Chuck Swindoll just said, oh, 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 oh. But you did get that about Mark Driscoll. He just said this, oh, 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 even though they both published books that say predominantly the same thing. But they attacked one, not the other, because the other is the president of a, used to be a president of a seminary and is a well-grounded person within the society. And the other one is a new guy. We can attack him. He doesn't have necessarily the experience on how to defend against this type of an attack. Let's go ahead and tear that apart. So people still do that today. They go after the new big fish in the pond rather than the established fish that are already there. And eventually they will get bold enough and brazen enough and they will go after the big dogs. But they're going to work their way there, work up their courage just a little bit. And so they go after Stephen. But here's something interesting. They're looking intently at Stephen and Stephen is given one more description that we're going to look at and then we're going to try to unpack all of this as far as what it means and what we can do with it. He's given one more description. This is about his face. This is weird. This is really, really weird. Okay, and it says this. It says they were looking intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an, like an angel. That his face shone. It's literally that it glowed out like an angel. Okay, it, that there's something is happening to Stephen's face. <laughs> You know, and this is so bizarre, but this does draw to mind a couple of very important parallels within Scripture that is necessary. 
There are two people in all of the Bible who are most commonly described as having one point in their life as having their face glow or shown like that of an angel. One of them happens to be Moses. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 29 and following, he's coming down from Mount Sinai after having spent time with God and receiving the Ten Commandments, and he is coming down, and everyone goes, oh, his face is glowing. It is showing forth like that of an angel. Another individual who was given this type of description is Jesus himself at the transfiguration that we can see at Luke chapter 9, verse 29 and following, where, where Jesus is, uh, is raised up, two other beings show up, and he is transfigured, his glory is shown forth, and it says that his face looked like that of an angel. So what's happening here is that Stephen's face is starting to glow. It's like, usually it happens when you're in the presence of God. Which means then that, the, that Stephen was so full of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, so full in such a dynamic way, his face begins to glow. And everyone looks at him intently, wanting to kill him, but really confused. Looking at him intently, and his face is glowing like that an angel. Here's something else that's interesting about this description. When we look at, outside of the biblical text, when we look at historical descriptions of people, and if you were to read books like the, um, like the Martyrdom of Polycarp and other type historical literatures that exist, you will find that within those texts, martyrs of the Christian faith, as soon as they begin their testimony before they are executed, are often described as having a face of, can you guess? as an angel. So what we have here is an individual who might be being connected to both Jesus and Moses and might be connected to the martyrs that are killed, that are about to be killed at the beginning of their testimony. And Stephen's about to give his testimony before his execution, which could it be? And I've read a lot of commentary trying to say it's one or the other. One. I'm just like, man, put your hands together that all of it is happening here and that this is a huge moment. Because we got what is happening is the first recorded martyrdom for the church in the book of Acts. This is what's happening here, and this is a huge moment. Huge, huge moment. That he's about to be a martyr, and he is being connected to both Jesus and Moses. The religious leaders should have looked upon Stephen and should have been able to have first, maybe, if they're up to date on current events, oh, you know, this might be like, for the Christians at least especially, this guy is like Jesus, especially the way that false witness was coming at him, but especially when you're dealing with Sadducees who should have been thinking of Moses. Are we executing a topology of Moses here? Are we angry at someone? We're saying he's anti-Moses, but yet his face is showing forth some type of glow, forth glory that is like Moses of being in the presence of God. They should have known better. It's amazing what anger and hatred can do to a person as far as blinding them to the facts and truth that's right in front of their face. And so, Stephen his face is glowing, begins to give an amazing sermon. We'll cover that next week, a little preview of things to come, and we'll cover his execution next week as well. I want to go back and look at what's happening with Stephen and what is happening all in this first point here that we got to look at in the first seven verses and ask ourselves, what is this good for regarding the church of today? Okay, what is this going to help us with regarding, because I believe that there's some amazing principles we can draw from this to help us better be a better church, to be better Christians. And it involves an interesting word that depending on your grammar, you may not know it, it's called ta. And when you think of the word ta, maybe what first comes to your mind is Looney Tunes. And thinking of Tweety Bird going, I taught, I ta, putty tat. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that at all. Okay, here's what ta means. Ta is a process of working with leather. Okay, ta is a process of working with leather. And what you do if you're going to ta leather is you're going to tan it, you're going to dye it, you're going to soak it, you're going to stretch it, you're going to work with it in order for it to become what it's going to be used for. Whether it's clothing, furniture, whether it's a belt, purse, wristband, whatever the case may be, whatever you're using the leather for. Okay, so, so that's, what, that's what ta is, is, is how you work with leather to get the results that you need. 
And what I'm going to suggest is that Christians and the church have got to develop a thicker hide. They've got to develop thicker skin if we're going to really do the ministry of the kingdom in our society. We're going to have to be as tough as, or take Run DMC's advice, and be tougher than leather. So we have to go through a tall process, a type of soaking, a type of preparation, a type of stretching, and a type of applying in order for it to be what we need to become. So we're going to use leather analogies for the rest of this to try to see what we can be as Christians. Because here's the thing, a lot of Christians, a lot of people in our society, we have become wusses. We have. We, there is a wussification of our society that has happened where everybody seems to be offended about anything. You can't turn around without somebody being offended. You can't be. Last week, our associate pastor, John Herrick, shared how people were all up in arms over the color of a dress. And then Salvation Army puts it on a lady with a beat up face saying, do you see black and blue? What do you see? And people get all offended. Oh, you're pro domestic violence. Ah, and people getting all offended and they're wanting the ad taken down. People are getting, uh, there was this one commercial. I saw it on TV before they pulled it and I laughed so hard. I went nuts. I, I couldn't believe how smart this was. It was for the Microsoft Surface laptop where it has the uh, screen that can detach. Have you seen this? Okay. And it's a pretty neat little device. It was kind of cool. You know, I'm, I, I like look at my laptop going, I wonder if this could, nope, that's kind of cool. Then you got a tablet, right? But here's what the commercial was, a little risque, but here's what the commercial was. There was a cell phone trying to hit on the computer, okay? So the cell phone's going to the computer going, hey there, baby, how you doing? Would you like to go out sometime? Maybe go out for a spin, and, and would you like to go out on a date with me? I, I know I'm a little small, but I can make up for it, and, and he's all just hitting on the computer, right? And then a person comes by and grabs that lid and takes it off, and the phone goes, oh my gosh, she took her top off. And <laughs> okay, and so it's just some people were offended. And so they complained. And the ad got yanked. You know, and it seems like all I can't get on Facebook for more than 10 seconds without seeing somebody complaining about something that they're offended about. I can't get on the Google Plus for a minute without somebody complaining about something they're offended about. I can't get on the news without eventually, within five minutes, hearing a story about somebody who's offended, causing controversy and strife. Somewhere, somewhere, someone's offended about something and it's driving me nuts. Get thicker skinned people. But that's, but that's, we're just becoming wusses that are all offended. I'll take one guy's advice. If you're being offended about something makes it go away, then let's all get offended at offended people. <laughs> make them go away okay so if the church is going to survive if the church is going to do what it's going to be doing and doing it right people are going to complain persecution is going to come there is going to be opposition and the church has got to have thick skin to not take it personally to be able to rejoice within their suffering and persecution call themselves blessed and to move on without giving up and persevere they got to have thick skin right we got it. Otherwise, if we get offended about everything that's happening, we're going to get burned out and useless and grumpy. And the church is already grumpy enough. We don't need more grumpy people in it. Okay, we need godly people, not grumpy people, right? Okay, and so we need to work with this. So we got to develop a thicker skin. So let's go through a tall process together. Is it going to hurt? Yes. Are we going to like it? No. <laughs> but if we go through it, in the end, we'll become a really neat chair <laughs> or a great pair of leather boots or an amazing belt. You know, whatever it is, will be something amazing instead of just some rotten hide on the edge of the street, which is how the church is acting. Okay, so let's go through the tall process together. The first one, when we look at the life of Stephen, especially when we compare it to the life of the other apostles and Paul, is this issue of kingdom triumph. Kingdom triumph, or another way of looking at it would be understanding what it means to be successful in the kingdom and what success looks like in God's kingdom. Because a lot of times we tend to look at success and we get all burned out because we don't see the results that is part of our definition of success. A little fun exercise for you. Mentally try to picture this a little bit and, and unwrap this with me. Think of your favorite hobby, your favorite job, or the ministry you're involved with, and ask yourself, what does success look like within that job? 
Okay, just kind of picture that in your head for a moment. Whatever your job is, whatever is just one of those heavy passions in your life, or whatever is just one of the most dominating things in your life, that's usually a vocation of some sort, and ask yourself, what does success mean? What does success look like within that vocation, within that ministry? Okay, and it's most people, if they start really unpacking it far enough and long enough, they'll start coming up with different things, but very similar. For example, maybe a Sunday school teacher would say, well, for me, success would be that the students are learning and the students are growing and that they are becoming more godly students, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe a pastor would be that, you know, that the message is getting out and that the church is growing and that people are being challenged and they're growing up in Christ, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe a janitor would be that I'm able to get the place clean and it's under maintenance and it's not having any jobs hanging over my head because it's all done and everything's being taken care of. Maybe for a teacher in a public school system, or within a college or university would be that the students are getting equipped and that they're being challenged and that they're being uh, edified within the classroom, that they're learning critical thinking skills and they're going beyond where they currently are. Maybe if you work at a factory or in retail, it's that you're getting all the customers are served and that all the products are where they belong and that I'm meeting up my quota, whatever the quota may be, that that right there is success. And then hopefully getting a bonus or some type of an appreciation award or some type of an appreciation type uh, check or or whatever the case, maybe a promotion might be in order in order to be able to have me feel even more successful within my job. Maybe for a student, it might be that they're getting good grades and that their GPA hits the dean's list or the honor roll. Then they can say that they're feeling successful within the academic system. Whatever the case may be, people have, if I hit most people there pretty good, at least get you a place where people go, that's usually what success looks like. Now, when that does not happen, none of that takes place. Students are not. They're being disrespectful to the teacher. They're getting low grades, and they're complaining that you're too hard as a teacher or that you're not getting the grades that you wanted to get out of school. You're not getting that promotion. Someone else got it. You're not meeting quota, and they're just the management doesn't seem to understand, and they're putting too much demands upon you. The customers come in making more of a mess than you can keep up with. Whatever the case is, everything you define as success is not happening. The church is not growing. The Sunday school class is not maturing. People are just as immature and as useless today as they were a year ago, and there's no progress, no development, and you feel like you're wasting your time. You see where burnout can come in from that. You can see where that becomes a problem. And let me challenge that very definition of success. Let me challenge that head on, because Stephen had no converts. Stephen, if you compare him to Peter, would be called unsuccessful, right? Peter goes and preaches, and people get saved, and he gets released. In fact, when Peter goes to jail, Peter gets an angel to release him. Peter got a ninja angel, remember? Chris Farley in a gown, right? Peter got a ninja angel that showed up and released him. Does Stephen get a Jedi angel who comes in and deflects all the stones when he gets stoned? No. No angel rescues Stephen. Okay, so Peter, people are getting saved. The church is growing by thousands. People are being ministered to. The the leadership is being delegated to godly people and is working. Everything's going great for Peter and the apostles, but for Stephen, he is getting everything is going wrong. No one's getting saved, and he's not getting rescued, and he is getting killed, and and no one's there for him. It looks like Stephen's not successful. But when you look at the life of Stephen, and you realize, A, God put him in the Bible. Usually getting mentioned in the Bible either means you're a complete manifestation of Satan himself, or you're a really great guy. Right? And one of the two is going on. Either you're a great example of wickedness or you're a great example of godliness. One of the two is likely the case because the Bible wants to give you the good and the really good bad examples. Right? So Stephen is mentioned, mentioned first, and his life is recorded. In fact, we know more about Stephen than any of the other seven men. In fact, we know more about Stephen than most of the apostles. Okay, so Stephen's highly important. In fact, Stephen even becomes one of those motivators and guilt issues for Saul, who is there and becomes Paul. 
Okay, Stephen gets to have his face shown like an angel. He gets to be referenced to being connected to Jesus as far as an illegal trial, having a glowing face, and Moses seems like great people to be compared to. Seems like great people to be compared to. Stephen was very much successful. Here is why. Let me just throw this out there, and this is going to be hard to accept. I'm going to share how Stephen is successful by giving you a personal example, how I encourage one of our members of the church who was very, very old, and in his last years, his name was Frank Bullock. Very godly man. And by looking at his later years in life, you could say that here was a man who is not living a successful life because he can't witness to anyone. He can't preach. He can barely speak. His mind had a heart. His mind worked very slow because of his great age. And one time while I was sitting at his house and I'm talking with him and he was saying, I just don't feel useful anymore. And I would love it, I guess, if God would just take me. But I'm still here. And I just don't feel useful anymore. And I gave him a word of advice that was really hard for him to hear. It'd be hard for you to hear, but it's 100% true. I told him, I said, Frank, for so many years, you've showed the people of our church how to run the race. Now you get to show us how to finish the race. So many people are really good at teaching us how to live well and run the race well, but they don't know how to teach us how to die well. They don't know how to teach us to finish well. And I told him, I said, Frank, you finish this race well. You show us what it means to finish this race with your head high for God, for his glory and his kingdom. You don't give up. You don't lack your perseverance. You stay true all the way to the end. You don't say, woe is me, take my life now. Instead, you take it all the way to the end till God takes you, and then you accept it when it comes, and you show us how to die well. And he said, that I can do. And that's what he did. Peter shows us how to do ministry well. Shows us how to do the church life well. What does Stephen successfully show us? How to finish well. How regardless of the opposition, regardless of anything, you know how easy it can be to see someone else be more successful at you at a job? To say, I quit. To say, I give up because I'm not as successful as they are. I don't have the results they have. You know how easy it is to give up? And Stephen did not. He, in fact, preached all the way till his last breath. In fact, he was preaching and praying to God while he was being stoned. We'll see that next week. Stephen finished well. That is a successful Christian walk right there. Sure, we might not be able to label it that. He doesn't have the numbers, but he finished well. That's kingdom triumph it's not just making it around the track so many times it's getting to that finish line appropriately it's finishing well it's kingdom triumph the second one it's called kingdom aptitude kingdom aptitude this is a fancy way of saying (laughs) you need to get smarter (laughs) Okay, this is a fancy way of saying you need to get smarter. All right, we we have to be adequately prepared in advance. Stephen gives an amazing sermon. I would love to just read the whole thing right now. We're saving it for next week. Within that sermon, read it, read it. Not right now, but but read it. When you're done here today, read it. The 50 plus verses, how detailed it is of the first five books of the Bible. Pulling out information that I looked at and reading his sermon going, oh man, I gotta look this up. Where is that? I know, is that still, that's Genesis, that's Exodus. There's some of the, oh, okay, there's Deuteronomy. Whoa, dude, and he's just going at it, and he's just, spilling out this information and he's pulling in analogies and pulling in examples and making a point giving leaving out certain details including including certain details in order to really tick off the, the Sadducees on purpose and, and he just like, like takes a knife and sticks it into him and goes Ehh! 
you know, and then he pours salt and pickle juice on it just to tick them off to the point that when they're, he's all done, they're all going, and it says they're gnashing their teeth at him. They're just so, they're almost rabid, okay? He just went at it, and he just knew how to do it well, okay? He, he just knew how to push all the buttons. He was prepared in advance, okay? This was a man who had wisdom, who was a smart man, who was well-prepared, well acted. And here's the problem. A lot of Christians today are ignorant of Scripture. Yeah, they could quote a verse here and there, probably not even in context according to the situation in which they're quoting it from, but they're just ignorant. They don't know the doctrines of the faith. They can't defend their faith. They don't know why they believe what they believe. Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God and completely inerrant? Yes, I do believe the Word of God is the Bible, and the Bible is the Word of God, and that is completely without error. How do you know that it's the Word of God and completely without error? Well, it says it is. Well, other books say they are. How do you know this one's right and those are wrong? I don't know. I just believe it. Well, there's a good argument. You know, dig into it. Find out why do you believe what you believe. Do you believe Jesus rose again? Yeah, the Bible says it. Why does it say it? How do you know it's right when it says it? Because we just got through wondering if it's the word of God. (laughs) So how do you know that Jesus rose again? How do you know that the church is God's church and God's bride? How do you know Jesus is going to return again? How do you know? You know, what? dig into it. If somebody asks you those questions, you say, well, I just believe it. Well, that's nice. How do I know I should be believing it? What if you're wrong? You know, let me go to fun little philosophy. Well, if I'm right, then I get the blessing. If you're, if you're wrong, then, then, oh, it's bad to be you. you know? and, but we need to get further than that. We have to give an account for our faith in and out of season, convenient or not convenient. We got to be ready. But here's the thing. So many Christians are like, I don't know where to start. I have the Bible, but I go to the Christian bookstore, and there are just so many books books. Where do I start? Well, I'm glad you asked where to start. Let me help you with that progress, shall we? I got myself a great little booklet bag here. Let's go ahead and get started here a little bit. You could try, if you want, to learn about history of the church and learn about apologetics. Total Truth by Nancy Percy. That's a pretty good read. Uh, We also have Vintage Jesus by Mark Driscoll. Talked about him earlier. Christianity 101, Gilbert Belzikian. Not even that difficult of a read. Know What You Believe by Paul Little. There's a good book to be able to work with. Uh, Despite Doubt and Dealing with Philosophical Doubt Regarding Your Faith, Michael Whitmer. There's that. Or maybe uh, Don't Stop Believing, also by Michael Whitmer. There's a nice book to be able to go into. Oh, look, we can also get into A Theology for the Church by Daniel Aiken. There's a fun book. Or maybe Christian Theology by Chuck Swindoll. That's not a hard read. That you might be able to work with. If you want to get real deep, you can go into the Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics academic archaeological proof for our faith. If you want, you could even go further and go into the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology and be able to go with it. And so there's lots, there's a start for you, okay? (laughs) There's just a start. And in case you want more than that, you want to take it a step further, each of these books have bibliographies in them. You can look those up on Amazon.com, buy those and read those too. That'll keep you busy to the day you die. There's your starting point. Dig into your faith. (laughs) Okay, so I don't want to hear any more. People say, I just don't know where to start. Here it is. This is your starting point. There you go. Have fun. Okay, see you next week when you got it done. (laughs) Okay, so you you get my point, though. It is hard. It is very hard to know where the good books are versus the bad books. It is very difficult because Baker Bookhouse and Family Christian Stores and Kriegel and Parable, they all sell books that are good and bad. They even sell books that are flat-out heresies. People claiming to be Christian, but saying God is not all-knowing. He is not all-powerful. He had no idea what's happening in the future. Jesus is not coming again. They have books that say that hell does not exist, and that God may, may or may not exist like we think him to exist. And on and on they go. Okay, there's a lot of bad books in those stores. It is hard to distinguish between the two and have good discernment. This is a good place to start, because <laughs> I've read these cover to cover. I hate reading. I really do. I'm going to be honest with you. I absolutely hate reading, okay? And yet I know that it's necessary. And I know that it's, I don't have a lot of time. I work multiple jobs. I teach classes at two different colleges. I pastor here. I work at the bus station. I also have a family. And for a while, I was full-time doctoral student. So I was just, I was really busy. And no, these are not textbooks from my classes. This was in addition to everything else because I want to continue to grow in my faith and understanding. And I understand that not every Christian can do that. I understand that each of us have a different learning curve. Each of us are slower at some things than others, and we're all going to mature in different ways. Totally true. Totally true. So you don't have to read every single one of these books, but I recommend reading something. 
something that doesn't have the words 50 shades in it, something that's not about you know, a wizard and a magical place. Read also something like this. <laughs> Okay, and if you don't know where to start, these are good reads. In fact, I like recommending this one because this one's written as if a, a sixth grader could understand it, and it's the seven core doctrines of the faith, doctrines of the church, doctrine of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the works of the Spirit. It has the doctrines of angels and demons and spiritual beings. It has the doctrine of, of the end times, all written on a sixth grade level. So, and, there's, and if there's ever happened to be a word that is complicated that you just can't get around, it gives the word and then gives you a good couple sentences describing it for a sixth grader to be able to understand. Okay, so this is an easy read. I went through this in just a couple hours. Okay, it is a really good read. So that's, this is the Know What You Believe by Paul Little. Okay, so th there are easy books, there are more difficult books, but they're good books. That's a place to start. And we got to know whys of our faith. We got to dig in more than where we currently are. We're not all at the same place. We all have different levels of maturity. But we got to take the step further than where we're at. We can't be just content with where we're at and our knowledge of the Bible and the knowledge of the doctrines. We got to go further. I know so many people that are able to defend Star Wars more than they can their faith. They can defend a Doctor Who more than they can their faith. They can talk about wrestling more than they can their faith. It, it's, you got to at least make them equal. You at least got to make them equal and take it a step further. Stephen does not pull his sermon just out of thin air. Stephen does not pull out his wisdom out of nothing. He worked at it for a while because the apostles said, when you're going to pick these seven men, make sure that they are known to be men of wisdom, known to be men who are full of the Spirit. In other words, before Stephen ever stepped foot in a leadership position, he had the reputation of being well-grounded and filled with the Spirit first. And then he was able to get involved into the leadership skills. Okay, And I know not everyone's going to get involved in leadership. But if you are going to be a Christian in a non-Christian world, you're going to have to be a type of leader to the people you come in contact with. You're going to have to be a type of an example, a type of an account to your faith has got to be given. you got to grow. you got to go more. And I'm telling you what, as much as we try, as John and I will team up together and try to pack at you for a Sunday morning, uh, week after week, it's not enough. It's not enough. All we can give you is the beginnings you need to take it and go further and go beyond so that you can be adequately prepared and equipped for the kingdom. So we need kingdom triumph. We need kingdom aptitude. Okay, so kingdom aptitude. These are like, in a sense, these two are the soakings, the, the tanning of the leather. When you tan leather, First thing you gotta do is when you start working with it, you gotta get all the fur off of it. Right? You gotta get all that fur, you gotta scrape, you gotta soak it a little bit in a type of, of lime and, and different types of chemicals to be able to strip the fur off of it. That's like redefining your yeah, lie, thank you. That's like redefining your triumph and success. And then after that, you gotta soak it in order to keep it from rotting. And then you can also, it's called tanning, and you can make it different colors. You can make the leather blue, you can make it brown, you can make it red, but you can work with it. And that's like the aptitude. That's soaking in the knowledge that is available to us so that we can get on to the third step. You thought these two were hard. This one's the worst. It's called kingdom wholesomeness. Kingdom wholesomeness. This means that you are living your life in such a manner that in order for opposition to attack you, they have to come up with lies to do it. This is living your life so well, so wholesomely, that people don't have proper grounds to accuse you of anything except being a follower of God. And if they're going to try to accuse you of anything, they're going to have to come up with lies because that's all that's going to work. This can look in a variety of different ways, but this is about lifestyle. This is about your lifestyle. Is your lifestyle wholesome? 
Is your lifestyle wholesome? For example, if you're, you know, do you dress modestly, saving flashes of skin only for your spouse, not for your boyfriend, not for your girlfriend, not for your fiance, but for your spouse only? Is that how you're dealing with your relationships? And are you looking upon the flashes of skin, only that which is the skin of your spouse, not upon other people, whether man or woman, not upon drawings or cartoons, not upon whatever's online or in a book, but that you are looking at the flashes of skin of your spouse only? Okay, are you wholesome regarding your relationships? Are you wholesome regarding your parenting, those who are parents? I had a person come up to me at one of the colleges, and they said, My, uh, I have a guy in the church, I'm part of a men's ministry program, and the children, they're in middle school, they totally disrespect their dad, they want to do nothing with him, they're just, he's trying to work with them, trying to work with them, but they're just absolutely disrespectful, rejecting his authority, we don't know what to do, how to help him. I asked one simple question, I said, how often is he around? And they said, well, he's not around very much at all. And I said, if you want the respect of a child, show me a child that does not respect their parents. I'll show you a parent who's not present. And you want that, parent, that child to respect their parent. That parent needs to be present. They need to be around. And they say, well, when he is present, he gives them quality time. And I said, that's a lie. That's justification for sin. That is not the case. You want to know how children define quality? They define quality by a mathematic equation. Quality equals quantity plus presence. That's your mathematic education for understanding the quality time. It is, it is presence plus quantity. It is a large amount of time where you are absolutely present, not distracted by playing on your phone or on your smartphone, not sitting there on the phone talking with someone or watching a game and having your kids play in the background saying, I'm present. I'm talking being actively, presently engaged into the life of your children. I am talking that type of wholesomeness to where you can't accuse them of being a bad parent because they are present. Then, then if they're able to be like that to their children over a long period of time and the kids still are somehow disrespectful, we'll have another conversation. I doubt we won't have to. But then we'll be able to converse about something. Is it that you know, you're, you're, you're being fired from a job, but yet and you say, well, they're firing because I'm a Christian. Or was it you had it coming, and it was totally well-deserved because you're the last to arrive, the first to leave, your bathroom breaks are 20 minutes, you take a pre-lunch, and that you fight with your customers, fight with your boss, rather than serving, thinking you know how to do it better, and that you want nothing to do with the customers, fired. You know, you got it coming. Blame God all you want. And they fired you because you were a Christian, because you wanted to go to church. No, you were a bad employee. Now, if you were the first to arrive and the last to leave, and you were polite to your boss, you did everything that they said, and then you worked with the customers, and you helped the sales of the business increase, and then they fired you because you talked about church, you can talk to me about a little bit of persecution in the name of God. But until then, you deserved it. You see, I'm talking about wholesome living. I'm talking about wholesome living to where there is no reason or grounds for blaming you for anything. You're able to be at peace with people. You're able to work with people. You're living a moral life, an ethical life, one that is above repute. And then when hardships come your way, we can say that you're being accused because of Christ. But until then, you probably got it coming. There's a lot of people that go through a lot of hard times and they got it coming. And so, I mean, you can just go on to Facebook and look at your posts and ask, what are your pa- Facebooks about? Are your Facebook posts more about complaining and more about you and more about plans, or is it about Jesus? Or is Jesus not even mentioned on your post at all? You know, how is your, I mean, you can really tell a person's spiritual maturity by their Facebook posts. You can. You can look at someone's Facebook. Just go back for the past three months and ask yourself, is anyone going to be a Christian because of their Facebook posts? Is anyone even going to know they're a Christian by their Facebook posts? Or is it just no different than any unsaved person? You see, how wholesome is your living? Do you make your plan centered around God's will and seeking his will and allowing his will to be different than yours? Or do you beg God to do your will? You know, how is your living? What's your lifestyle like? Is there room and evidence for well-grounded accusations against you? Or do you have wholesome living? The person that says, hey, my, my boyfriend, my girlfriend broke up with me because I would not sleep with them because they wanted to have sex, I wouldn't do it, and then they broke up with me. There's a person that is being persecuted for righteousness. I won't lie on the job. The job wanted me to do something that was uh, falsifying some of the books. I wouldn't do it, and they fired me. That's being persecuted for righteousness. But we want to justify so much as being persecuted for righteousness when it wasn't. 
And if we're going to have thick skin, we're going to realize that it's, it's, we need to be wholesome in our lifestyle. We need to be godly up front. And that faith needs to be public. It absolutely must be public. I mean, everything else in our life is public. People even make public cat has cheeseburgers. You know, people make public so much these days. Oh, my, my kid just did this. My job did this. And what about Jesus? Isn't he a big part of your life? Isn't that public? You see, we got to have, and it might may be that we don't do that. Maybe we're afraid. Maybe we're afraid that people will mock us or people will say unfriended. Maybe we're afraid that people will make a bad comment. And I've seen it that you'll make a, people make a comment or they'll make a statement, and then people will make trash talk on their comments, and then they get all mad. Oh, I can't believe they said that. Oh, my gosh, I just got to, I got to reply, but I got to think how to reply. How am I going to reply? Ooh, I got to say something because they said this bad thing on my comment. To comment. Who cares? It was, an, it was an ignoramus person declaring their ignorance. You know, let it be. You don't have to reply. If you're going to be upset over every criticism that comes your way, you're in trouble. And here's the truth. People that are afraid of criticisms, let me just be frank and honest with you. No one on this earth can criticize you more than the cross already has. No one can criticize you more than that. The cross of Jesus said that you deserve death because of your wickedness. The cross of Jesus says you're already a failure. You're already a bad student, bad parent, bad child. You're already a bad employee. You already are bad. You already are sinful. In fact, you're so sinful, the death penalty's coming your way. That's what the cross of Jesus says. It already criticizes you. And then it says that God loves you so much that he's willing to put Jesus to die in your place. You're on death row. He took the chair on your behalf. The door is open. You're free to go. The cross of Christ has already criticized you. Anyone else that gives you a criticism, you can flat out say, you know what? Accurate or inaccurate, you remind me that I am not a perfect person and that I have stuff that's worth criticizing in my life. And thank you for that because nothing criticizes me more than the cross of Christ. And I know that that's been taken care of. So nothing, nothing anyone else is going to be able to say is going to add to what the cross has already said and nothing anyone's going to say is going to take away what the cross of Christ has already taken away. So we don't have to fear the criticisms of others. Instead, we can embrace them as asking, are they accurate? And if they are, they need to change whether the person's a moron or not. If they're accurate, you got something you got to change if they pointed out something that's accurate. If it's inaccurate, then what difference does it make? And so we got to just have this thicker skin. Otherwise, what's going to happen is this. You're going to end up living unwholesomely in order to defend a reputation. You're going to end up acting and speaking unwholesomely in order to try to win a battle that you're going to lose just by playing. If we elevate our reputation as the most important thing in our life, and we have a real serious problem. The Bible calls that idolatry. We have to have wholesome living. And if we have wholesome living, we'll have wholesome responses. Or we'll be wholesomely silent. Because sometimes silence is all that needs to be given. Sometimes we need to open our mouths and speak the truth. And we need to do so wholesomely. So that's our tall leathering process here. We need to understand what it means to be successful, what triumph looks like. We need to understand that we have to have aptitude, that we're going to have to soak in more and develop our understanding better, and that we have to have our lifestyle be completely wholesome, at least more than it currently is. I understand that we won't be perfect at it, and we're all going to screw it up. I've screwed it up. You guys have screwed it up. I know. I'm on Facebook enough to see your screw-ups. I told you, Facebook's a wonderful tool. <laughs> okay, it's, it's just, you know, it just is. But we all screw this up, but we all have to work toward being more wholesome. That maybe, maybe, as people look upon us, they might be able to say, let it be said of us that the Lord was our passion. 
Let it be said of us that it was his fight that we were fighting and that we fought it well. That we didn't just run well, but we finished well. Let it be said of us that. See, then we will become the church we're supposed to be.